So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so today um, I'm going to uh, give a, a small presentation on um, hyperbolic geometry and its usage in machine learning. Now, um, this particular avenue of machine learning is fairly new. Um, the first papers in the domain um, emerged in, in mid-2017. Um, and you know, there, there's been some work in, uh, um, in the area since. Um, um, uh, of course, that's what this, this presentation is more about, but I'll also mention some, some gaps that um, I've noticed or so areas where um, this, this direction of research can be taken further. Right. Um, as usual, um, I'm gonna it's this this the same is gonna be very high level, because um, you know each of these papers themselves um, each uh, can can constitute an entire like hour long presentation. Okay, so with that, uh, let's get started. So first, before um, let me start discussing the virtues of hyperbolic geometry for uh, machine learning. I'd want us to take a bit of a step back. And I want us to actually contemplate or, or at least be aware of um, the notion of representation learning. So what do I mean by representation learning? Now, uh, feature engineering is a critical step in, in any machine learning or defining task um, uh, because you know sometimes the base um, rudimentary uh, primitive data that you're given is, is doesn't um, doesn't contain enough signal in their primitive state to um, allow you to actually suss out the patterns for you to be able to make predictions. Um, you know that 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 the objective of like say supervised learning. Um, now, of course, this is still uh, a very important step in in machine learning and data mining practice, um, but one of the um, what perhaps one of the drivers behind um, the 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 current um, hegemony of neural networks uh, that we're living through um, is that neural networks actually help us automate feature engineering to an extent. And how how this works is that the hidden layers of a neural network, um, what it does is that it leads a way to remap uh, data points in one space to another space that's more convenient. So I'm just going to go through a little, very short example, um, explain what I mean by this. So let's consider this. This is um, the half moon classification problem. Um, so that you know, as some of you would know, this is a toy example that's usually used to um, uh, provide a nice case for where uh, linear models um, tend to be insufficient. Okay. So if you look at this example here, you have two classes, the red and the blue. And you, you can't exactly think of like a line, a separating hyperplane that you can draw that gives you a particularly good classification rule here. Okay. So this is why this is considered a good case study in I just checking to make sure you were awake. Good case study in um all right. Consider a good case study uh for um uh, non-linear classification. So now, of course, um, for those of you who are familiar with, um, you know, uh, rudimentary ML, you know, the first thing you might jump jump out to try try to solve this would be like a, a decision tree, right? Which can learn and affect a non-linear decision boundary between them. But let's just say, for example, we, we wanted to we really wanted to use um, a, a neural network to, to solve this problem. Right, so let's just consider this super simple neural architecture up there on the screen. So we have a single hidden layer, all right, and then we have have our output layer, all right. This is a classification problem. So our activation function g sub three would you know be the standard sigmoid, and let's push our data points through this neural network and just try to learn a classifier for these data points. Now. Something, of course, that uh, I guess would stand out to, to some of you all already is that this last bit, this output bit of the neural network, um, it, it accepts two inputs, scales them by weights, 
and then passes through a logistic sigmoid. So this is just logistic regression, right? So this last bit of the neural network is logistic regression pretty much. Um, so we know the last bit does logistic regression, but what is the bit before? What does the hidden layer do? And if we pass this data set through our, um, our neural network there, and we inspect what we get right at the edge of the hidden layer, you'd notice that uh, what has happened is that the neural network has taken our initial problem, a problem that is intractable using um, a linear approach, and it has re-represented that problem into a form that is amenable to a linear approach. Because you can see in that example there that, I mean, you can't come with a perfect um, line that would separate um, the two classes, they're still a bit intertwined, but you can come up with, with a sensible rule that would give you good performance. Or sensible hyperplane, I should say, that would give you good performance, right? So that's the, the takeaway, I guess, to some extent of what representation learning is, is that it's this aspect of neural networks that allows us to take, um, take a problem defined in one space and learn an, a representation of that problem in that space into another space that makes um, solving that problem a whole lot easier. Okay, and that's that's something just to kind of keep in mind as you go forward in terms of talking about why hyperbolic geometry is in some cases a useful geometry to use in machine learning. Okay, so this is for an over a continuous uh, space, um, but there are uh, discrete, sorry, there are, um, there are, we can also use it for discrete uh, spaces as well. So what do I mean by discrete space? So these are points defined uh, in, in, a, in a real vector space, but you also have other objects of study that are not um, innately, um, there's no innate way to represent them as uh, vectors in some real vector space. And you know, most machine learning techniques, or at least uh, 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 most machine learning techniques, um, depend on your input data being in these in the form of these vectors. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, let's consider words, right? Words are discrete entities, uh, but how can we apply like logistic regression or or, um, or, or linear regression or all, all of those other sort of um, te um, techniques that are the bread and butter of most ML practitioners, how can we, uh, how can we use words with these techniques? We, we, can't, we can't do that right off of the box. Um, so where representation learning has become um, quite a, um, useful is to learn a representation, a vector representation of these discrete entities in some real vector space. Um, so, you know, um, in Mikolev et al's paper in 2013, you know, they, 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 they presented a method for doing so. And, you know, you, you have the, the famous example that if you take the vector representation that's learned for, that's learned for the word king, subtract it from the vector representation for the word man, and then add the vector representation of the word woman, and then you, you try to find the vector that's closest to that output vector, you're going to, you actually would find that it's the vector representation of the word, of, for the word queen. Okay, so you can see, um, you know, the value of these representation learning for these discrete spaces. In the case of graph mining, wherein we have nodes in a graph and we want to project that onto some real vector space so we can apply um, more run of the mill uh, machine learning models to that data. Uh, you can see here is that we have this graph topology. Uh, this is the famous um, Zachary's Karate Club graph. And we here notice on the side, we have the vector representations of the nodes in that graph learned using a method called um, deep walk presented by Perosi et al in 2014. And you notice here that um, the 
nodes that are close together in the graph topology are close together in the corresponding vector pro uh, projection, right? So the, the, the vector pre projection uh, mirrors to some extent the graph topology. Okay, so how does this representation learning work? Uh, in practice, you you have um, so you basically have a lookup table that's your mat a matrix of parameters, and you have just an indexing uh, mechanism, and you can use that to get a representation, a vector representation that's initially randomized, and then you use that those vector representations in, in, in a to solve an auxiliary problem. Um, usually to model the, the data itself in some sense. So in some sense, you consider like semi super, I'm sorry, self supervised. And from that to back propagation, you learn representations that way, right? So the, the, the takeaway for some for representation learning at its value with these sort of discrete spaces is that it allows us to take these difficult to solve semantic problems and to, re and to represent them um, as easier to solve geometric problems, right? And these geometric properties, all right, of our points in this and our projection, um, are, are proxies for these for these um, semantic properties that that we sometimes might have difficulty actually um, capturing and, and pinning down, right? So uh, just to go take a little bit of philosophical aside now. Uh, let's distinguish now between the notion of a map against a territory. So we have an actual entity, and then we have, um, so for example, on, on your left there, you see like a satellite image of Trinidad. And then you have on the right, you have a map of Trinidad. Now, the map is not the territory, right? The map is a representation of the territory, okay? and. What essentially we have to think about a bit when we're doing representation learning, and it's a bit of a, probably a bit more philosophical point, but as you see, there are some practical implications of it, is that a map is a lossy, it is um, necessarily a lossy representation of a territory, right? But what makes one map of a territory better than the other is that you have some notion of a query or a family of queries that you want to interrogate these maps with. And some maps are better at answering those queries than others, right? So you know George Box's famous statement, um, all models are wrong, some models are useful. So that, that's sort of like one way to kind of think about how can we distinguish which models are useful? How can we actually like, you know, organize models in terms of how useful they are, right? It's about the queries that we're going to interrogate against these maps, against these models. Okay, so we want to keep that in mind because a, a map, um, in a sense, is only as good as the paper it's drawn on. Okay, and, and that's a bit of an intuition there that uh, I just want everyone to, to take forward as we as we go along. All right, so let's talk a bit about hyperbolic geometry, right? Um, a geometry that it would not be hyperbolic to say is, is kind of is kind of odd. Um, so most machine learning models assume uh, Euclidean geometry, right? So you know, uh, parallel. This is the geometry we would have spent most of our um, education learning about. You know, parallel lines cannot intersect. Um, it's homogeneous with zero curvature, which which means it's flat. Um, uh, a, a bit of an aside, um, for those of you who, who know some geoinformatics or some geography, you know you can't use um, you know, standard Euclidean methods to, to analyze distances and stuff like that in, because the Earth is um, contrary to what some people believe, the Earth is not flat. Um, but let's um, think about a bit what we mean by a geometry. So a geometry can be thought of as a space with a structure on that space. And um, please, um, anybody with a, with a topology background, please don't get angry at me. Um, and um, as a consequence of these two above properties that we mentioned about Euclidean geometry, it's, it's less packed, right? So um, hyperbolic geometry is different. Um, it has negative constant curvature. So uh, that means that there are saddle points that kind of bend like this way away from every point. And you know, so that, that's very different already. Um, 
from Euclidean geometry. It also allows something really weird to happen. Uh, it actually allows parallel lines to actually intersect, right? Which it just sounds like 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 really really uh, like a really eldritch concept, right? For parallel lines to intersect, but hyperbolic geometry just basically um, just basically ignores Euclid's fifth postulate, right? Um, so, for example, uh, the example on the right is actually a case there where you have what is defined in hyperbolic geometry as a line, I guess, more formally spe speaking, what's, what's called a geodesic. And there are point, all of them are going through the same point. So all those are parallel and they, they all um, go through a single line. Spherical geometry is also like this. Um, in, a, in a spherical geometry, um, there are actually two points that that we know a, um, a bunch of parallel, infinitely many parallel lines pass through, and those are the north and south poles, if you will, of a spherical geometry, right? Um, so you know, this this um, parallel lines can intersect is uh, I mean we consider it so much uh, uh, so important, but it's really a kind of um, Euclidean sort of um, formulation. Now, a, a consequence of these two things is that Euclidean geometry is, is in a sense kind of larger, sorry, hyperbolic geometry is in a sense kind of larger in Euclidean geometry. And what we mean by this is that the distance from the origin grows exponentially as you approach the outer disk of hyperbolic geometry, of, of hyperbolic geometry, right? So hy hyperbolic geometry is defined in like a, a region of space, uh, usually a, a, a unit sphere, or you or should say a unit hypersphere. Um, and you know, as you approach the edge of, of that region, um, the, the distance actually grows exponentially, right? As you move away from the region, right? So there's an interesting consequence of this. Um, so some of you might have seen like this, this diagram before. Um, each of those squares of the same color are actually the same area, right? Now, of course, a, a base of, of our Euclidean intuitions, that just seems so wrong. But it's because of, of the particular um, eccentricities of hyperbolic geometry that that is the case. This is what I can what I meant as well by the whole exponential increase in um, in in, in, uh, in distance from the origin as you as you enter the close close to the disk. Um, the different models of hyperbolic geometry. Um, each defined by a different underlying metric. So hyperbolic geometry, hyperbolic geometries are also metric spaces. Um, they come equipped with, with, a, with, with a metric tensor. Um, there are five main models. There's the Poincaré disk model. Uh, there's the Lorentz model, the Poincaré half plane model, the Beltrami Klein model, and then this hyperboloid model. In, in the case of the ML literature, um, for computational reasons, as well as reasons, um, analytical reasons. Um, the uh, Poincaré disk model and the Lorentz model are the two that are actually used um, in, in, in most uh, work right now. And actually, that is, uh, you might be thinking that that the other three might be good average to possibly attack. Maybe they would be. But they are, uh, there are some, some, is some issues with them that do make them a bit more uh, computationally difficult in terms of things like how you actually calculate distances and angles in, in those. Okay, so uh, let's just discuss a little bit about these two uh, two models. So the Poincaré disk model uh, um, and versus the Lorentz model. So uh, typically, um, so you see there, the first um, the first row actually gives a description of the, the spaces um, as a subset of, uh, of, of you know the real a real vector space, so you have dn is it the, the n-dimensional Poincaré disk model, and here you notice that um, that the sets in in that geom and the, the sorry the points in that geometry um, uh, are from you know the um, the real vector space of size n, where it's all constrained to a unit disk. All right. Um, Lorentz model, which is HN, is, is defined so similarly, but notice that you you um HN is actually a subset of R n plus one. And you notice that you actually have there's a special Lorentzian inner product um that's comes tenth tie to the Lorentz model. Um and it's um 
points within H sub n uh, have to actually satisfy uh, that referential property there uh, in the set descriptor. You also see the distance, func distance functions. Um, uh, you know, with that, what I just mentioned, you can pretty much read off what those are, except uh, so uh, lambda x and, and lambda y refer to what's called the conformal factors of points x and y in the point carry this model respectively. Uh, and then you have this, this thing called a tangent space. Um, so you can kind of think, so these models of hyperbolic geometry are um, manifolds, which means locally, they kind of appear Euclidean within a, a local neighborhood, they appear Euclidean. And uh, you kind of think of a tangent space as a, a subset of the a real vector space that you can kind of lift a point of out of and then push it back in. Once again, I know that's not a particularly rigorous definition of a tangent space, um, but we'll see a bit more about the intuition behind this um, in a couple slides now. Right? Um, so actually, I should actually show you this first. So this is what I actually mean by like just like the tangent space. So you have the darker curve there. Right, and then you notice you have this this semi-transparent sheet, and this is like the case here with the point carry disk model, right? Where t sub x of m, so m is the manifold, right? And then you have t sub x of m, and this is the tangent space with respect to x of that manifold, right? So this is like a kind of sheet. That's sort of extrapolated from that whole locally Euclidean property um, from that point x. Okay. Um, and what you do is that you have these two functions, the logarithmic map, and you have the exponential map. So the logarithmic map, what it does is that it would actually um, lift a space. So let's say, for example, I have a curve, it would actually lift a space from, I'm sorry, a point from its it's pointing the manifold to lifting it into the tangent space. And then we have the exponential map that actually that actually drops it back down into the into the original space. Okay, so it, it maps it out and then logarithm maps it out and then exponential uh, maps it back in. And of course, as you would imagine, these are these are inverses of one another. Okay, um, so why, I mean, sure, okay, this is all nice and well and good. I'm sure topologists might have, must, must have a really, really fun time with hyperbolic geometry when they aren't talking about how, um, how, how, how spheres and donor and um, coffee cups that they say really just the same thing, right? Um, but the, there's actually a very interesting um, property uh, of hyperbolic geometry, and that is um, as shown by work by Astor et al. in 2014 and Kriokov et al. in 2010, hyperbolic geometries can actually be seen as continuous analogs for trees, right? So, um, so you can see an example here of a tree embedded essentially within hyperbolic geometry on your right there. Um, and trees encode hierarchy and graphs. And of course, these systems that can be represented as graphs usually possess some sort of latent hierarchy that drives uh, behavior within these systems, All right? So the, the, the core idea is that if we have a graph, excuse me, that is defined by these latent um, hierarchical um, aspects, maybe hyperbolic geometry is a more sensible paper into which we should etch our map that represents the graph, right? And that's the core reason behind the usage of hyperbolic geometry for representation length, right? So I'm just gonna give a, a brief review of some papers in, in the interest of time. I don't wanna to go too, too, too long um, discussing um, some of the work that has been already been done in, in this particular space, right? So there are two main works that were the genesis of this avenue of research that were both um, done at the same time um, and published in at least well at least put out an archive around the same time, and, and that's work by Chamberlain et al. Um, from from Imperial College London and Kiela Nickel of 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 um, Facebook AI research. 
right? And um, Chamberlain et al.'s work was initially presented at um, KDD workshop in machine, in machine learning on graphs um, in 2017. And Kiel Nickel uh, uh, initially put a preprint up an archive, which was then subsequently accepted into the into um, NeurIPS, formerly known as NIPS, in, in 27, December of 2017, right? So what it did, of course, was uh, pretty much uh, what I mentioned, so I'll talk about Chamber et al.'s work first. They embedded nodes in hyperbolic space. They chose the Poincaré disk model of hyperbolic space. Uh, what was interesting about their work, and uh, something that um, nobody else has really done since, um, probably because of practical reasons though, um, is that they actually use a polar coordinate system. So uh, as opposed to using um, real, as opposed to using the vector representation of the Poincaré disk model, there's an equivalent uh, formulation where you use polar coordinates, right? So radius and, and um, theta for the angle to the, to the, to the x-axis. And uh, they actually defined their, all of their operations in terms of these polar coordinates. Uh, because, of, because of that, they only considered 2D hyperbolic space. Um, and then they considered as well Euclidean benchmarks of higher dimensions. Now you're going to be thinking this is kind of an unfair comparison uh, because you're, because um, you, if you can scale Euclidean up arbitrarily, but you can't with the point point carry in this case, is it really a fair comparison? As we see, um, there's some very interesting results here. Um, so what did what Chamberlain did uh, at all did as well was that they used you know the standard skip grand script grammar negative sampling um, format pioneered by Mikhail et al.'s word effect, and they used and um, and they used a similar loss functions such as to Perusi et al.'s deep walk and Grover et al.'s note effect. Um, they used a hyperbolic so what it did is that um, in you know, Wurtevec and Notevec and Deep Walk, you, you have um, the strength of association between two entities as being the, the Euclidean in a product. Uh, but what Chamberlain et al. did is that it defined a, a hyperbolic um, in a product in terms of polar coordinates and they swapped that out, uh, so the Euclidean one for, out, out for that. Um, so they had some interesting results. So uh, this was the um, the F1 scores of uh, node classification um, after training. And all of those red lines are actually um, from Euclidean embeddings. And the blue line is for the hyperbolic embeddings. Uh, and what's, what stands out here is that, remember the hyperbolic embedding is in two dimensions. But deep walk with 128 dimensions cannot compare to the hyperbolic embeddings with just two dimensions, right? So it turns out that even though, in a sense, the hyperbolic embeddings were disadvantaged in a sense, they still um, were, uh, in most cases, I think it's just in weird adjacencies, right? That it, didn't it wasn't as clear cut, but in most cases, they, um, their performance exceeded that of the, the, the um, of the Euclidean counterpart. Okay, uh, Kiela and Nickel um, uh, approach it using a more standard vector representation. So in their work, they actually considered um, for pockets of their work um, um, dimensions greater than two. Two in terms of the high dimension in a bit. Um, they also use negative uh, negative sampling esque uh, loss function, um, which you can actually see there in terms of actually learning representation, right? Uh, so what I mean by they use uh, a, a more complicated opposition process was well, as it turns out, um, if you use um, standard gradient descent. There's a possibility you might knock your knock your parameters outside of the manifold. Um, so what you need to do is that you can't use vanilla gradient descent, but instead you actually have to use um, variants of gradient descent that essentially was projected gradient descent. Uh, so they they were able to define um, a projection using the metric tensor of the point carry this model. And um, 
we're able to apply it uh, thusly to be able to learn parameters in that, uh, that lie on that point carry disk uh, manifold. Right, so you have your clear ingredient there and it, it scaled appropriately to accommodate all of this. Right, um, they took WordNet, um, which you know is, is a data set that represents the hierarchical representations of words and just treated as like any old graph. And they learned representations hyperbolic space using um, for WordNet. Uh, and what you see here is that if you if you look at the descriptions of the labels inside of and the nodes inside of this projection here, you notice that the the, the hyperbolic geometry is actually able to capture and represent the uh, the underlying hi hierarchies of WordNet. So, for example, if you um, if, if let's say you go to let's say go go up, you see rodents. You're seeing um, you see okay, you see marble in the center, and then you see rodents a bit a bit further off to the edge, and then you have um, you have like squirrels actually judging out of there. Um, so you can see that the closer the point is to the origin the more, pro, um, the higher it is in the hierarchy of concepts encoded by WordNet, right? So you can see here that, that it, it, the point grade this model is able to actually capture this, this latent, well, this, this, this hierarchical information. They also um, uh, ran experiments uh, for graph reconstruction and uh, for link prediction. And what you notice is that with uh, while uh, as you get increasing number of dimensions, the gap closes between um, Euclidean and the Poincaré embeddings. Um, for, for relatively small dimensionalities, there's a much wider gap, right? I mean, um, the, 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 uh, let, if you look at, if you look, for example, at uh, Quant Map or the, the GRQC um, uh, graph data sets, you notice a, a much much stark, a much more stark difference there in terms of the reconstructive capabilities of the hype of the point carry embeddings and the capacity of the point carry embeddings to help with link prediction as a downstream task. Okay, so you know that even you know, even though yes, you can get good performance in Euclidean, you can get comparatively you can um, the performance um, when you when you kind of uh, control for dimensions. Uh, is better with the point carry embeddings, right? Um, no, okay. So that is for um, graphs alone. Uh, but then Ghani et al. Uh, 2018. So um, their group at um, at um, EPFL. In, sorry, uh, ETH Zurich. Sorry, I confuse them a lot. ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and they worked on trying to adapt neural networks on the whole to operate in point carry. Uh, in the point carry hyperbolic disk model. Um, so uh, what, what they did here is that they exploited some ideas, some abstract algebra, which it was always kind of nice to see some, some abstract algebra and some, some, some ML papers. Um, and they use a gyro vector space as kind of algebraic basis for the hyperbolic space, uh, much in the same way that, you know, the, 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 um, the regular, those, Notion of a vector space over a field is the is the linchpin of standard Euclidean um, space, and the exploit operations defined in hyperbolic space because there there is some work I believe in the quantum mechanics literature that that exploits hyperbolic geometry, um, like uh, operations such as Mobius addition etc. They, they expand um, notions of a hyperplane um, in hyperbolic space. Um, they come up with a more general optimization procedure um, in exploiting the law, the exponential map um, uh, of, of um, the point carry this model explicitly within um, the optimization formulation. Uh, what was quite interesting was um, how they ended up defining matrix multiplication. So like, you know, there's this joke that, you know, neural networks uh, neural networks are just a, just a giant pot of, of matrices that, that, that people just stir around, right, and get magic out of. Um, so what, what they did here to define matrix multiplication for these hyperbolic neural networks was that they, they, um, they would project the, they, they would project the point out into the tangent space, 
which is a which is um a subset of Euclidean geometry that behaves in a more normal way. They apply the matrix in that space, and then what they do is that using exponential mapping to map it back onto the manifold. Right, so they map it out, do the operation, then map it back in. Right, and you can see that you're able actually to even get a closed form formulation for matrix multiplication in hyperbolic space. What's quite interesting as well is that they also, um, so this is general for functions, but what they actually found was that um, they, they did this for non-linearities. So like, you know, your ReLU, your PreLU, your, your Sigma, et cetera. And what they actually found was that in general, actually the performance was good even without the usage of an activation function. All right, so it has some interesting results. So here's the, the notion of like a hyperbolic hyperplane. So you can see that it, it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of curve inside of the point carry disc, right? Uh, they, they, got, um, they got better results than the, the Euclidean embeddings from before in terms of uh, classification scores with, uh, with, with WordNet, right? Though, uh, like with before, you notice that there is a narrowing of the gap between the Euclidean hyperbolic performance as you increase the number of dimensions. Right, um, this is an example here, the example of the hyperplane and hyper hyperbolic. So they, they trained the, the points in hyperbolic space as seen on the right, and then the hyperbolic classifier on the left, and, they, and then drew the hyperplanes that were um, Cars out in those spaces, uh, you notice that, of course, the, the hyperbolic uh, one gives a, a better fit over the um, the red points than the than applying the Euclidean logistic regression as seen in the right. Right. Um, Kiel, Kiel, Kiel and Nickel actually also presented another another interesting paper in 2018, uh, where they use the Lorentz model instead of the point carry disk model. Use a similar loss function to what they used before, and um, what it did is that there's actually a, a diffeomism between hyperbolic, uh, sorry, between Lorentzian space and Poincaré disk space. So you can map between them, and um, what it did is that they would do learning in Lorentz space, and then what they do is that for visualization they would project into Poincaré disk space. So um, here they are. Um, they compare the the um, the uh, I think this was uh, right right the the mean the mean the mean rank and the mean average percent uh, precision and experiment correlation for WordNet again um, as well as several other data sets and they consider the point grade versus Lorentz and you see like for the standard ML task the Lorentz is, is actually um, better in this case lower is better and um, here um, they they, um, they they project back to point carry this space to um, to actually visualize data sets. So this is the Enron, the famous Enron data set. So uh, this is a data set that was uh, you know the the, um, the firm Enron when it when it went under um, the the email emailing network of Enron became public domain, and um, you know it's it's a data it's an interesting it's a data set that you would expect some latent hierarchy to exist here because you have the hierarchy of employees within Enron, and uh, as you can see here, um, the Renz model when then projected to Poincaré disk was able to actually capture some of the latent feature hierarchies of that email and network, right? So this, uh, while WordNet is ex kind of explicitly encoded, edges only exist if there's a hierarchical related relationship. There's no necessary, I mean, if an edge exists, I mean, you, you could be even to a colleague or, or, or whatnot, right? Somebody the same level. And, you, you know, so there's, a, there's very much a latent hierarchy here. And the method was able to suss out that latent hierarchy. What's also interesting as well was that they actually use um, data um, regarding um, some similar characteristics, similar characters between different languages, and they're actually able to sort of discern a sort of hierarchy uh, of languages that sort of capture um, the sort of uh, origins uh, of different languages, right? So, you know, languages are spin-offs of other languages, so you're able to actually capture that latent um, hierarchical information just using a regular graph. 
right? So, uh, uh, you know, there are some other papers in, in this space, uh, but as well, there's a lot of discussion that you could have on it. Um, but let's give a bit of a, a bit of a rundown on some other work that's been done in this domain. So this point carry glove, which you know, in the glove um, with embeddings, point carry glove just just takes that uh, method and swaps out the Euclidean in a product for a um, for a dist for the for the um, point carry dis distance metric. Um, it also manages to capture latent hierarchies. There's some more general work on extending multidimensional scaling to hyperbolic space. Uh, it turns out there's this really nice sort of symmetry between solutions for Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic space as well, that um, you exploit a similar semi-definitive programming formulation to actually learn um, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, dimension, the reduced dimensions. Uh, there are some work where, because as I said before, you can't just apply regular gradient descent to um, this, these problems, you have to use a special versions of projected gradient descent. So this has actually spawned off some additional work in adapting these methods to work on, on more manifolds and, the, and to able to actually prove similar guarantees on these manifolds as you would for standard Euclidean space. Um, on some of the things that we are doing, we are currently looking at ways to extend this work to sign graphs um, uh, because they are, they, there's actually latent hierarchical information there um, that, you know, that we can that could possibly be better represented in let's say Lorentz space or point carry disk space. Uh, what would be interesting as well would be to compare um, Lorentz um, versus point carry for, for for glove. Like if the 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 Lorentzian inner product um, is a better idea than the glove. Um, so the, the point carry distance function. And it's also an interesting point here with second order optimization methods. So like, I mean second order methods that exploit the Hessian aren't all that popular for neural networks. But there are papers out there that, is, that talk about guarantee, formal guarantees to these methods. So it's, it'd be interesting as well to, to possibly work on um, can, in the same way that the guarantees for um, uh, first order methods can translate to hyperbolic space, um, can a similar adaptation be done for um, uh, second order methods as well. Uh, with that, uh, oh, one other thing that I thought was kind of cool was that there's this paper that in ACL of last year, where they're also able to do something um, looking at the hierarchy hierarchy of um, different music genres. So I also thought that was that, that was a that'd be a nice little um, cl uh, close off image there, right? So you can see like the different um, relationships between these different genres of music. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for listening to my presentation and would welcome any questions from the floor. Uh, inter interesting talk, uh, Inzimam. Um, <clears throat> as, as with a lot of these things, you know, so basically somebody tried hyperbolic and it worked better. Um, but, you know, I, I guess it's the same thing like with, with, with neural networks, right? I mean, people don't really understand why it works so well. Some there's some something in it that seems to work well with real data. So is, is there something here as well that the fact that hyperbolic works well because um, because of the some properties of real data as opposed to random data? Well, um, it's it's because of that latent hierarchy that's that's embedded within because we we pretty they're pretty certain because it's actually another paper I didn't get a chance to mention where um, they look but it's more of a paper that's that's a bit more of a. Uh, a kind of topology paper, but it was actually done by some people at Stanford, um, not Chris, um, Christopher um, Ree from Stanford and some of his students. What they actually actually able to show was that if there's latent hierarchical information within a graph, you can embed it with arbitrary position in a hyperbolic space in a finite dimensions. But in Euclidean space, it's not it's not possible, or that you can't guarantee it. So it's kind of like kind of, kind of, kind of like a bit like a universal function approximation theorem, wherein, like with neural networks, in principle, you know there there are guarantees like you know um, with, with two hidden layers, you should be able to to model any continuous function that kind of thing. It's kind of like that, where for every graph that contains a discernible tree structure, there will exist a hyperbolic embedding um, 
for it. And this is a direct consequence of how the distance grows as a function of the, well, the distance. Uh, because it's because of how uh, more compact it becomes as you move away from the origin. So it's a direct consequence of the heterogeneity of, of the space. Okay, yeah, in interesting stuff. Thanks. Hey, yeah, uh, nice presentation, Izzy. Um, I, I was curious. Did. Oh, mm -hmm. so sorry, I did something else. Yeah, I, I was curious if uh, there's an embedding. Yeah. So is it possible to utilize uh, like hyperbolic spaces in things like UMAP? Uh, there, well, that same paper yeah. I mentioned towards the end with MDS is, um, it, it is the closest okay. to it. So I, I would actually imagine, I, I, I do believe, um, um, that they, actually, I know there was talk of a lab trying it a while back. Um, Stitch okay. Fix, the, um, the, clo the company that helps with, I'm not sure if you all know what Stitch Fix, but it's a company that, that helps, um, that kind of like acts like a kind of digitalized personal stylist kind of thing. Um, I know that their head researcher um, actually mentioned, I, be I believe they were looking for looking at it, but for TSNE, oh, okay. come to think of it. But I, 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 I they, they claim to have had something that was working and something that would be published towards the end of the year. This was back in um, 2018 yeah. in, um, in, in um, KDD in London, they had, they had actually, I, I remember actually attending the tutorial and they actually mentioned towards the end that they were working on it and they suspected should have it ready by December of that year. But I didn't hear anything come out of Stitch Fix, fix with regards to that um, since. Okay. But, but, but I guess as, a, as Prof was alluding to, is it pretty much a case of you try it and see if it works or is there like conventional wisdom that guides you towards some types of data sets, you know? performing better in one space versus in <laughs> So if you can model the problems a graph, is there sort of measure of treeness? It, you know, like, so, so like uh, maybe, um, I, I would actually, that'd be interesting actually thinking about like, if you could probably have like some sort of metric that 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 uh, like edit distance kind of thing where it's like um how many uh, a proper tree uh maybe that as like a sort of a measure of treeness and I, I would, but i would suspect based off of these results as well as based off of some of the um the theory that the higher the treeness of a graph the better it will embed in hyperbolic space okay Nice. But I, I would I can ima I would imagine computing that treeness factor like that would be um kind of difficult because but my gut feeling that is that, that sounds like NP. Okay, that, I mean uh, that's your research topic then. Yeah, I guess okay. so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Thanks. That would actually that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting actually. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say a very nice presentation, Insamam. Um, just have two questions. Um, in early on in the presentation, when you were showing the representations learned and stuff, isn't that similar to the um, SVM kernel trick when you just change the dimensionality representation of something so you can create a separable data, right? Yeah, yeah, essentially. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in front here with, with this for example here. Yeah, this one, yeah, early on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, essentially, essentially yeah, that, that the, the kernel trick pretty much operates on the same same idea. But I kind of just want to kind of like like lead in sure, a sure. bit by uh, discussing, yeah, like, you know, it, you know, sometimes, you know, people talk about machine, um, neural networks with their magic. Yeah. Um, but what they do is actually quite, quite logical. It, it's, um, I mean, so even though we may not understand some of the mechanics of, of how it works, um, if, if unfortunately, um, analysis does not yield um, as much insight as we would like, you know, we still understand enough to know that, you know, it's this, it's this representation learning kind of thing that it does. Uh, you know, I guess what, one thing with SVMs is that, I, I guess it's hyperparameters anyway, but, yeah. you know, so, some people might consider like choosing the kernel type, but it's RBF, because this, this is actually soluble using RBF. 
If you yeah. use our radial basis function kernel, this is this is soluble. Yeah. Um, but you know, as I guess as opposed to probably some people might say that how um, maybe choosing like say the RBF kernel is imposing more um, structure than the, the neural networks. But yeah, it's just it's just a reason to show that you could learn the the the, the kernel essentially. I yeah, think actually there's cool. an interesting paper. I think that actually makes a stronger tie between them recently. Um, I think it's uh, was it every deep layer network network is a deep kernel machine or something like that. Oh yeah, I, I could have sworn I could a paper. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah, me too, yeah. Could, yeah. It looks familiar. Sounds familiar. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. And then I mean, I need to go and kind of go over this presentation to get the hyperbolic um, representations, how it's applied to ML properly. But it's it was very informative. So very cool. Okay, thanks. Um, there's actually um, Gany et al., yeah. um, the authors of the Hyperbolic Neural Network paper um, from ETH Zurich. They actually have a site uh, where they literally just devote towards discussing hyperbolic geometry for machine learning practitioners. Um, so they also discuss, like, a, I, I didn't discuss it here because it's kind of um, out of scope, but there's um, there's these notions of, of um, so standard hyperbolic geometry is a is a is a constant negative curvature, curvature of one, but you know one of the things they ask later on in some other work is um, about um, how, about learning the curvature of the space and even like things like non-homogeneous curvatures. So where you have different regions of the space having different curvature. So like they, they, they discuss a lot of that on on their site. You can probably let's just have your mind. I can I can um I can send you the um the the, the blog. Yeah, yeah, sure. Blog. It's a it's a WordPress blog, but yeah. Yeah, I'd love to take a look at it. All right, great, thanks. No problem. Okay, let's thank Inzamam for his presentation. Um, actually, I just have one question. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was giving someone else a chance. Uh -huh. Um, nice presentation, Inzamam. Um, thank you. Even though I didn't grasp everything, and I actually didn't know about hyperbolic um, before, about with integrating it with weird embeddings. Now the thing is, I actually read it like one time, but I had no idea what I was reading. So I really appreciate the explanation, um, because I all I got from it before was that, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, is that um, you know, in like how. Okay, Euclidean is much simpler and, and easier to understand when you have your weight embeddings in your weight space. But mm. the downfall for it is that you, you it can't really easily um, find that co-occurrence between like that thing in linguistics, like, you know, entailments, right? Mm -hmm. So, and one of the positives with hyperbolics is that from what I read is that the um, hyperbolic has the ability to include that level of similarity with the um, uh, semantic entailments, which Euclidean cannot do in, with weird embeddings. So that's basically like all I read about it, but I didn't read further on it. So I was just wondering if you came across um, that. Uh, yeah, there's. Um, I know there's a paper as well from ACL. I think last year. Um, I guess actually, I think there's a Poincaré glove paper that I think was in ACL a few years back, and then there's also another paper from ACL that I think came out last year, which which actually does actually. Um, I I think both of them had mentioned the entailment, but I think, um, yeah, I, I can't I come across a bit because like you can represent the sentence structure as a tree, so that's where again this um this the value of this treeness kind of comes in and the, the efficacy of the, of the hyperbolic space in terms of the treeness. Um, actually, I, I, uh, I could probably send you the paper as well to see if that's the one you're talking about. Because um, I, 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 I I'd also looked at... Yeah. Sorry? No, I was saying it, it actually didn't read a, a paper on it. I honestly think it was just a blog I was reading. Or oh, not okay. a blog, but like an article, because I didn't get mm. deep into it. Um, because I, I, my, my, I just stopped it like a with weird embeddings, learning regular stuff like with Euclidean, I never went deep into it like this. So it's a nice way for me to um, get um, acquainted with the concepts. So thanks very much for that. But yeah, I'll, I'll look okay. into it more with the, um, applying it to the sentences with that, that vagueness. 
for the sentence relations. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. no problem. I think one, one little thing with it is that, um, I guess for real, like uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of the content that might be more relevant than ML practitioner, where a lot of these papers tend to be drowned out, drowned in a lot of topology and real analysis. So, I have like one oh, question. Sometimes, oh. um, yeah, sorry. No, I just gonna say that um, like, um, so I know that like uh, the uh, like words, for instance, have like a, a, a exponential distribution over frequency, like some words, if you, if you look at that, for instance, right? And I know in some, uh, like some hyperbolic, sorry, some, some with some curvatures, you have, uh, you, you find where like, um, so this is what I know from cosmology, right? But I know in some curvatures, things scale uh, exponentially. So like radiuses, for instance, would have like an exponential scaling. So I could see where, for instance, because you have this underlying um, exponential distribution, like in wood frequencies, for instance, that embeddings of woods would do better in uh, spaces where uh, the curvature allows for, you know, more efficient, um, how to describe that, more efficient, mm, representation of of, of 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 exponential stuff so so the question i guess i want to know is like one so so that would mean that not all hype not all species would perform as well as um so you'd have some species that perform better than 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 um Euclidean and some that will perform with for, for given operation c because of this mm -hmm. you know property so so do they have like a way to determine the curvature like is there because that's something that you, it, it, it seems like it, it sort of depends and it might be uh, application specific. So if you're looking at words, you might have one, you know, particular range that you might be interested in. If you're looking at like something else, you might have, uh, it could be positive, it could be negative, for instance, you know, so how do they know what curvature to use? Um, in terms of that, that is, I guess that's still some of you an open question, but there are some approaches that do try to learn um, the curvature as well. So it, it actually, um, the same Ghani at all, they have this paper, I think it's the called, um, I think it's K stereographic projection, I believe, um, wherein they try to actually um, learn the curvature alongside of uh, the embeddings themselves. Uh, because one thing that's quite interesting is that uh, in one paper, I saw that um, uh, for that, an elliptical geometry outperformed the hyperbolic one for, for a particular task. And that was quite interesting to me uh, because yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that that's, that's positive curvature. Yeah, so that would make sense that different curvatures would, would, would perform differently, essentially. It's not that you have a case where, you know, Euclid, uh, Euclidean uh, zero curvature is just beaten by anything positive or negative, but that, you know, you would have some things that perform better and some things that, so, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just that uh, the ceiling that is admittedly uh, it, it, it's still a, a very much an open question because um, there's a lot of um, as you see there's a lot of um, because to, to do work in this space um, admittedly it's, it, I, I'd imagine it's quite difficult because you have to have a very particular mix of expertise um, to, to actually do it. And but yeah, you're like, right. Like, any sort of performance improvements in terms of like ease of being able to to perform like in, in terms of like. Uh, I could see in some cases you have the benefits maybe in terms of accuracy of, but in terms of like, um, like just, you know, um, ease of doing things, for instance, is it like easier in some spaces um, getting to a certain result? I, you know, just looking at the benefits, for instance. Yeah, it's, it's easier in, in some spaces. So for example, like with the, um, a lot of the cases, the, the lower dimension hyperbolic um, tends to be a bit more performant than the, well, more uh, performant than the compare, com the, uh, the same dimensionality with Euclidean. So there, there, are, there, are, there are, you know, cases, cases like that. Uh, in terms of training, um, there, there, there is something of a, of, a, of a mild performance hit though, in terms of um, training time, because you, um, you also have that, that step way with the exponential map for the, gradi the, um, the gradient. So because you have that additional step, it does, it's a very, it's a mild penalty it, it introduces. 
as so, so that that's a, that's another trade off. So sometimes you know that 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 um, you know has to be said. Also, um, dong stream methods. Um, you know, I mean, there's like hyperbolic um, mo um, logistic regression uh, and whatnot, but there 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 there's only um, the only major paper that um, comes to mind about um, adapting a bit more run of the mill hyperbolic methods would be. Um, there is a paper on trying to adapt um, SVMs to hyperbolic space, but they they, stay, um, they, they stopped at uh, trying to define uh, an analog for the linear kernel. And like say, they, they just had left the, uh, the RBF as future work, uh, but I haven't seen any work been done in it since. Yeah.